I never ever dreamed that I would talk about a movie in a khutbah and uh, surprisingly today I am, to my own surprise. I have news for you that on 18th of April in Saudi Arabia, the first publicly shown movie in movie theaters will be Black Panther, a movie which celebrates the worship of ancestors. One of the, you know, the movies are just old fashioned. Uh, you know, I think the word is hikai thing, telling stories. It's a storytelling exercise. The idea is that the main people in the story <coughs> resonate with you and they inspire you to do good things, change, etc. So now we are launching this new phase in the Holy Land with a movie which celebrates ancestor worship, which is very interesting. The reason why I bring that aspect of the movie is because long before Islam, one of the things that pagans did was ancestor worship. It is because of the ancestor worship is that the tradition of remembering the Shichara, the family tree, is so profound in certain parts of the Muslim society 
because prior to Islam there was this tendency to highly respect and worship your ancestors in some form or the other. We are going through a very profound moment in Muslim history today. I try my best not to talk about politics from the middle, but I think this is important and it needs to be addressed. Because what you are witnessing today is exactly what happened in the past to which we were not witness. And because it was not so widely covered by social media and global media and satellite TV and WhatsApp, etc., there was no awareness, instantaneous awareness among the Ummah in the entire Muslim world in the 19th century and later in the 20th century as to what was happening in the Muslim world. But thanks to social media and global media today, we know right away, within a few minutes of decisions being made. Saudi Arabia has remained as an anchor to the Muslim community for a long time. We call it Saudi Arabia now, but as the land of the Arabs, as the land of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu it has remained central to Islam. We actually do our, our Qibla is in Mecca, and if you look at the global map, also the map that most of the world uses actually places Saudi Arabia in the middle of it, right in the center. It's not just the map that Muslims use, it's the map that everybody uses. So, Saudi Arabia has been central to our lives, so the changes that take place in Saudi Arabia will nevertheless have global impact, whether you like it or not. Whether you like it or not. For example, some masajid in Delaware follow moon sighting in Saudi Arabia for doing it. And I've had extensive debates in saying, does it mean that we are endorsing that particular madhab? Are we following that particular interpretation of the deen? The reason why most people accept it is because it gives us a seven or eight hour head start. And because we get that head start uh, during Ramadan, Eid especially, that is Saudi Arabia declares Eid, we have seven hours to prepare. So we prefer to do this. It is not a, shall we say, a theological affirmation of what Saudi Arabia is doing, but it is a recognition that what Saudi Arabia is doing is actually convenient to us in America. In California, you get 10 hour head start, so you can actually find out before you go to bed whether Eid is tomorrow or not. So the changes that are going to take place now and are taking place, and I don't know whether those changes will happen or not in a significant way, but they are going to have a theological impact. For example, some of the practices that have changed in the past few months, one change is women getting the freedom to drive. The biggest challenge will be when taxation comes to Saudi Arabia. That is the long-term goal. Most of it is driven by financial needs of Saudi Arabia today. But these changes are coming theologically. For more than 30 years, the nation defended the prohibition for women to drive on the grounds that it is based on the Sharia. That is the point that I want to discuss today with you. So has the Sharia changed? Have we received a new wahi? So how does it happen that something that has been defended for 30 years on the grounds of Sharia, how does that change? The Crown Prince also made a very interesting statement yesterday affirming the right of the Israelis to have their own land. Nobody questions it. He didn't actually say that they have a right to a land in historical Palestine. <coughs> may have a right to land in Arizona, who knows. But the fact is that it will be spun in the U.S. to say that now even the most important community of Muslims in the Muslim world have recognized Israeli rights to that land. That is how it will be understood. And if you don't want it to be understood in that way, then make sure you frame it or exclude that particular interpretation. For example, if I tell you, you can come to my house whenever you like, that means you can come to me at 3 a.m. If I don't want you to come to me, my house at night, I'll say, well, you can come to my house 
whenever you want, but make sure you don't come after 10 p.m. or before 6 a.m. So that is how you qualify your statement so that it may not be misunderstood. In this political arena, it is important for us not to understand. What the prince also said is very interesting. He said that we are now going to return to moderate Islam. That term is very interesting because more than 10 years ago, I actually did a book on that topic, debating moderate Islam. I brought different Muslim scholars and professors and intellectuals and shuyukh together to ask this question, what is moderate Islam? And what do we think about it? The book is available if you like it. You should go take a look at it. So, but to assert that we will now return to moderate Islam also is a confession that we have not been practicing moderation until now. That is the, the what is said is not important, but what is implied is more important. The prince also implied that this particular brand of Islam was propagated since 1979. A very important year in the history of Muslims because two major events happened. The occupation of Afghanistan and the Iranian Revolution. So he basically implied that it was the need of the West during the Cold War to spread a kind of Islam. You can call it whatever you like, Salafi Islam, Wahhabi Islam, whatever. But billions of dollars were spent to spread this Islam in the Muslim world. People in my family take pride and say, say Allah Hafiz, not Quda Hafiz, as if God is monolingual. You know, he will not understand that you are addressing him. Make sure you speak to God in his only language, which is Arabic. So all of this, this is just one example of thousands and thousands. The biggest obsession is with deviancy and bidah, 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 bidah. Look, billions of dollars have been spent in spreading this particular brand of Islam giving money to specific people who will propagate that, building masajid, who have the imams with that particular kind of thing, all over the world, including in the US. There are many complications. For example, the Muslim Brotherhood was very powerful in the US. The Saudis were afraid that their students would get influenced by Muslim Brotherhood type ideology, so they invested in the masajid in the US to keep the Muslim Brotherhood's ideology outside the member. They stopped all this after 9-11 in terms of at least funding massages in the U.S. But some people still do. And now we're going to reverse all of that. What's going to happen is that the old model of Islam that Saudi Arabia was practicing is going to be practiced by Muslims outside Saudi Arabia and they're going to insist that this is the correct version and what's happening in Saudi Arabia is wrong. What is going to be fascinating is what is impact going to be on the Hajj and Umrah. What does moderation mean there? That is the question that we need to ask. And where are all these ulama of Saudi Arabia who are so eager to attack everybody all over the world for any slight deviance? Yaza, hasabida, hasabida, yaqi hasabida, kullu vida dalala, kullu dalala finna. Where is that now? If showing movies was haram last year, then how did it become halal this year? One of the things that you must all remember, and very few ulama will remind you of this, especially from the member, especially in the US, they're always obsessed with what is haram, what is haram, what is haram. They think their full-time job is to tell you what is haram. But you must remember, that calling that which is halal haram is just as bad as calling that which is haram halal. You understand that? There is no leniency on one side and toughness on the other side. If God permits you to eat bread, saying that eating bread is haram is just as bad as saying eating pork is halal. So now when we make these diametrical opposite switches, why isn't there an uproar? To me, the most fascinating thing is not that the Saudi ulama are not saying much. They're all afraid they'll go to jail. Many of them have already gone. 
They are used to their wealth and prosperity. All the privileges will be stripped out like this. I was on the board of Prince Al Walis Institute for 10 years. I know intimately what has happened with him. People were waterboarded in hotels and so on and so forth. But now the challenge is why are American Muslim organizations and institutions and Masad is very quiet about this? And to me, the most fascinating thing as a scholar who observed this phenomenon will be to see the changes in the massages. Watch, all of you, how the massages in the US changed to mirror the religious political changes in Saudi Arabia. It will start from our homelands, not here, because here we don't take money. And this is not something that happened for the first time. Iran is 96% or, well, that's what they claim, 96% Shia. How did Iran become Shia? During the Safavid Empire, the Sultans of Iran, in order to keep the Caliphate away, brought in ulama from Lebanon, Shia ulama from Lebanon, and empowered them in Saudi Arabia, gave them money, gave them platforms, gave them control of schools and institutions. And within a generation, the majority of Iranians became Shia. You can see the transformation. Many of you know of Al-Azhar University. Al-Azhar University was established by a Shia Sultan. She was part of the Fatimid dynasty, which is a Shia, kind of Shia community, the Ismailis. They established Al-Azhar University. Today it's dominated by the Sunnis. And if you talk to Sheikh Al-Azhar, he says that there are no Shia in Egypt. Maybe he's true. You just have to go to Husseini Mosque. You'll find a lot of them, but that's okay. It's not a significant problem. So the ideology, theological beliefs, of the communities and nations can be fundamentally changed by government policies. You can watch, watch Turkey if you don't believe me. See how Turkey is changing. It went from being religious to secular in 1920s to such an extent. It is so funny that even religious people are addicted to alcohol in Turkey because of the old culture but they are changing. So you can see people becoming more religious in Turkey. More money is being given to Islamic foundations and Islamic organizations. There is more Dawa work. You discover more scholars. Two years ago, I made three trips in just November to Turkey because every week there was a symposium on Ibn Khaldun. We had more symposiums on Ibn Khaldun in Istanbul in November of 2014 than in the entire Muslim world before that. And the reason that was happening was because the Turkish government was throwing millions of dollars, bringing scholars from all over the world, and producing a kind of knowledge. If I were to come and give this masjid, say, a donation of $2 million, with a caveat that at least the second or third Juma should be from this particular madhab's perspective. If the board rejects it, I guarantee you there will be people in the community who will reject the board, put in a new board, and take that money and do it. So these are some of the changes that are taking place. The good thing is that we live in a global community there are people in Saudi Arabia who can't say what they want to say, but they can make a phone call to me and ask me to say on their behalf what can be said. You couldn't have done this 100 years ago or 150 years ago. So there is a chance for Muslims sitting here in Delaware to have an impact on what happens in the Holy Land, what changes come about there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Awwadu billahi min shaitani rajim, Bismillahi rahmani rahim, wa kazalika ja'alnakum ummatun wasat, 
litakunu shi huda ala nas. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and this is a very famous ayah, all of you know, that we have created you as a balanced nation, ummat al wasat, so that you can bear witness on the ummah, on what is happening in humanity. That is what I'm doing in the khutbah today. I'm not hiding. I'm bearing witness to what is happening in one of the most important communities of the Ummah. I have no problem with the Saudis watching movies. I, I saw that. Yeah, I think yeah, I saw that movie. It's not that I'm against people, Muslims seeing Black Panther. That's not the point. The point was how does it go from being prohibited to being permitted? That is the question to me. That is the intellectual, that is the spiritual question. Because to me it was permitted, I never thought it was forbidden. Every new technological innovation in the Muslim world was first banned and then permitted by the ulama. They were against loudspeakers, they were against telephones, they were against televisions, they were against photography, they were against videos, they were against Facebook, now they have their own Facebooks, their own satellite channels, every major scholar in America spends thousands of dollars promoting himself on YouTube. Whoever is your favorite scholar, click, click them, but see it says very clearly promoted. They are paying money. They are paying money to have their faces, their videos, their photographs promoted all. Just 10 years ago they would say this is haram. Because has been a yaqi, it's an innovation, but now it's useful for us too. So what does this word justly balanced mean? This is the key question. If the prince wants to go back to moderate Islam, then perhaps he should go back and debate this issue in society. I think the Saudis should have the freedom to ask each other this question. I wrote a memo to the prince, you should see that it's available widely on the internet. It's called Memo to MBS. So just Google it with my name, Muhtada Memo to MBS or Memo to Muhammad bin Salman, you will find it. I also have an audio tape of it so you can listen to it if you, while you're driving. Some of you may have already received it because I sent it out to some people on the email. But the question really is, you can't push a certain interpretation of Islam down people's throat. You can, but it will be wrong to be oppressed. So have a conversation. Let's have a global dialogue on what does it mean to be the Ummat al wasl What does it mean to be in moderation? The way classical Muslim scholars have understood it is very interesting. There are various places in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself says. For example, in Surah Al-Farqan he says, there are those who when they spend are neither extravagant nor miserly, but follow a middle between them. That is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Don't overspend and don't underspend. Be balanced. Be moderate. That is an important thing to do. In another place in Surah Al-Luqman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Be moderate in your pace and lower your voice. Verily, the most disagreeable of sounds is the voice of a donkey. In a, in a corollary, in a hadith, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says actually that when you read Salah, don't recite the Quran very loudly and do not recite it very softly either. Just keep it moderate. Everything about Islam, whether you are spending on yourself, whether you're spending in the name of Allah, whether you're reciting the Quran, everything that is advocated is moderate. You know, there are many kinds of Islamic literatures. There is Quranic literature where you do uh, tafasir and history of the Quran, people talk about miracles of the Quran, then there is hadith literature, etc. There is also a body of literature called Shamail. It is about the nature of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So if you look at the description of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you'll find that this is how they say, he was neither tall nor short. He was neither dark skin nor light skin. Yes, the Sufis say he was the most handsome man, most beautiful man. The Quran tells points to Yusuf alayhi salam. But the beauty is in our heart because we see him with that love. So everything about Prophet wasallam was in moderation. With the golden mean of things. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, before that I want to tell you a story. Once uh, Salman and Farisi anhu, went to visit another Sahabi. I can't remember his the Sahabi's name. I think it is Abu Darda, but I'm not sure. So, but remember, it was Salman al Farasi who, who went to visit his friend, and when he went to visit his friend, he saw his wife first, and he was kind of shocked by her appearance. She looked in really bad shape, and she looked very poor. She looked un. She looked to him as if she was not being taken care of. Then he met with the Sahabi, and the Sahabi offered him food, and Salman al Farasi asked him, "Why don't you join with me?" And he said, "I'm fasting." And after that meeting, they went to sleep. I think in those days, the men slept outside in the tent most of the time, outside the tent. So, Salman al Farsi looks at his friend and says, why aren't you sleeping? He says, I, I don't sleep at night, I do ibadah. Salman al Farsi said, no, come and sleep here. So, rather than disturb Salman al Farsi, who did go to sleep after Isha, this Sahabi also went to sleep. They got up for tahajjud, they prayed tahajjud, they prayed fajr. And this is what Salman al Farsi told him next day in the morning. May Allah have you grant his peace and blessings on this beautiful Sahabi. He says, My friend, you have a duty to your Lord. You have a duty to your body. And you have a duty to your family. So you should give each one of it its rights. Do not take away from your wife's rights to please Allah. Do not take away from the rights of your body. Do not do dhulm on yourself, on your family, on your children in order to excel in one aspect. Because what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want? He wants you to be a justly balanced nature. He wants you to be a good son, a good father, a good brother, a good member of the community and also a great follower of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and a great servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But not sacrificing one for the other. It's like saying you're accumulating positive points in one and getting negative in the other and it balances out you're left with a zero score at the end of the day. That is what this umat al wasat the word means moderation, not to do things in excess. There is a very beautiful ayah in the Quran and I think it's in Surah al Naam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَأَنَّ هَذَا صِرَاطِ الْمُسْتَخِيمِ فَاتَّبِعُوهُ وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا السَّبِيلِ فَتَفَرَّقُوا بِكُمْ عَنْ سَبِيلِهِ So what the ayah really says is that uh, this is my path which is straight so follow it do not follow any other ways for they will mislead you so the way Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi explained this to the Sahabi is he drew two lines on the ground and said these are extremes and my path and this is why if you notice it is my path he's not talking about sirat al mustaqim he's talking about my path so just like prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said goes through the middle and this middle path is the straight path and, and there have been historically a lot of discussions and debates among Muslim scholars. What does it mean? Does it mean that in every community that we live, if there are two extremes, should we always choose the middle path? That is the debate. And that is the debate that we also need to have. If you look at in America, America, everything has moved to the right. So let's say if in 1970 we were here, and the country was here. This is extreme right, this is extreme left. If Muslims adopted the middle path, we would be here. But now that the country has moved so much to the right, this is extreme right, this is extreme left, then the middle path will be here. So in 30 years, how does Sirat al Mustaqim move from here to here is a question for us to ask. We can't remain here while the entire universe moves this way or that way. Is that what it means? There is no definitive answer out there. It's not easy to be Muslim. 
There is no definite answer. That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us to apply the law with hikmah. This is where the need for the Muslim community to do shura, to do ishtihad, to bring the hikmah of the ummah together to understand what is today the balanced path. What is today it means to be a moderate. The word moderate Muslim is anachronistic. A Muslim by definition is moderate, he is balanced, he can't be out of sync and out of balance. That is the point of the message. So I'm not really concerned with the specificities of what the Saudi government is going to do. They're now going to go, the whole politics is to go to a way where you have an IPO of Aramco and sell Saudi natural resources to the rest of the world, raise money. They badly need money, they're going into major wars, fine. They're doing what is necessary. I'm more worried about the religious justification on our communities. We are not going to benefit from the financial losses that Saudi Arabia may have got, or the financial benefits they may gain from these things. But the theological justifications which they may use for their politics will definitely have an impact on our communities, on our children, on the way our children understand and practice Islam in the future. It will cause debates, it will cause divisions. Because some may go with the new changes, some may resist the new changes, and that division will be here too. And that is why it's important for us to debate these things openly. I'm not giving you a final answer on what is the right answer. I don't know, maybe they're all right. But I do want to have a conversation, and I want all of you to have a conversation of what does it mean to be Ummat al Wasat? What does it mean to be a balanced community? There are some explanations from Prophet Muhammad. He gave one example saying, let's not be as extremists in one direction. For example, he pointed to how Christians took their prophet and made him God. And then he gave the example of some Jewish communities at that time who rejected prophets, including Prophet Muhammad and their own prophets before that. That is another form of extremism. Our path as Muslims is moderate. We respect and love the Prophet Muhammad more than our own families, but we don't make a god out of him. That is the balanced path. So in a theological sense, you do understand what is moderation. What becomes difficult is when we get into the minutia of daily life. When it becomes into the minutia of daily life. If you have $5,000 to do in Sadaqah, how much do you give to Syria? How much do you give to Mazdidisa? This is not a fundraiser, don't worry, just using that as an example. If you give all your money to Mazdidisa, that is a form of extremism. I think Nabil is looking at me. But if you give all the money away to Syria and give nothing to Mazdidisa, then you're actually undermining yourself. So that is the second challenge. So how do we implement this idea of moderation? I have two recommendations which I made to the Prince and I understand the memo has reached his desk. I don't know whether he reads or <laughs> will respond. I'll find out when I apply for visa, I guess. But this is my recommendation. I think as thinking beings, as Muslims, we should always advocate ishtihad because it is through ishtihad that we keep text and context connected. That's it. I'm not recommending one particular answer. I can offer my ishtihad to you, accept it or reject. When you reject my ishtihad and go and accept someone else's ishtihad, you are yourself doing an ishtihad. Remember that. You think this is, argument is more persuasive than that. But I think that is one way to do. Let's never close down our minds. Keep our minds open. The second recommendation that I want to give you is what to target. Let's target Ahsan. Let us try to become more sins in our, in our lives. That is the goal. Two things. A community that values Ishtihad and a community that aspires for Ahsan. If we do that, inshallah, we may be able to realize a type of Umat al wasl <coughs> Thank you.
Alhamdulillah wassalatu wassalamu ala Rasulullah Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi Ya ayyuhalladzina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima Your brothers and sisters uh, As you are driving here to the masjid you must have noticed the mountains of stuff flying in the parking lot so we need volunteers to come out there and uh, do it in moderation don't spend your entire weekend here and don't spend zero time here but come here spend a few hours maybe half an hour after every salah and volunteer some time maybe a couple of hours on Saturday and a couple of hours on Sunday to help the masjid take care of its uh, the labor of love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that only those who have true iman get an opportunity to build a masjid. So if you are unable to get, now I have to come after saying this. <laughs> if you don't get the opportunity to come and volunteer, then think and reflect on what that I am meant. Okay, so it's very important that please come and help the masjid. It's not just about pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm sure that this, when Muslims are working here and volunteering out of the love of God, this place will be flooded with angels. You have an opportunity to rub shoulders with angels and work with them. But what is also interesting is that it will increase the love between the brothers and sisters who come here and make this Ummah and this community more loving to each other. I want to recite to you one ayah from the Quran. It is the first ayah from Surah Al Isra, the 17th Surah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Subhanallazi asra bi abdihi laylat. من المسجد الحرام إلى المسجد الأقصى الذي باركنا حوله لنوريه من آياتنا إنه هو السميع البصير. On April 13th is the night where, according to most people's predictions, is the night of Miraj. This is the spiritual epic in the life of Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. If you look at the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم as a practitioner of spirituality. Then you can see that for many years, even before he became a prophet, he used to extract himself from the society and go into the cave and practice meditation and reflection. And the benefit of isolating. When you isolate yourself sometimes temporarily from the people, beautiful things happen to you. When Musa alayhi salam separated himself from his people and went to the desert, he had an opportunity to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. It's a different thing that we don't have the capacity to do that. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu separated himself and in the cave he saw Jibreel alayhi salam when he became the Prophet of God. So his spiritual journey begins from that moment when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed there was iqwa. Iqwa bismi rabbi And after that, the peak of his spiritual life is the night of Miraj when he ascended into the heavens and came back. He came back to us with five salah came back to us with Fahim Salah. For many years I had never made this connection because many scholars believe that on the night of Miraj, Allah, uh, Prophet Sallallahu may have seen Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in some form. There are lots of people, in fact this is the majority view in the community. So when you define Ahsan, أَن تَعَبُدُ اللَّهَ كَأَنَّكَ تَرَاهُ فَلَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ إِنَّهُ يَرَاكَ Ahsan is to worship Allah as if you see Him and if you do not see him, know that he sees you. And since Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu brought the five obligatory salah after Miraj, where he may have seen Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, I realized that every salah that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam performed was in the state of Ahsan. All he had to do was to replay what happened to him during the journey of Miraj, and so he was always worshiping Allah as if he was seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the blessings, at least one second in our life, where we can taste one part of that state of Islam, that how that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam experienced. Rabbana ta'ina fi dhuna hasnatum wa fil akhirati wa hasnatum wa qinna hazam al nahr inna allaha ya'amur bil abdi wal ihsan wa itad al qurba wa yanhan al fashay wa munkah al baqiya alakum la alakum tazakkaroon most people who end their khutbah ended with this ayah. And I don't know whether you reflect of it. Just think what I said. Inna Allaha ya'amaru bil adli wal ihsan. 
It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is telling us that justice is not enough without beautiful things. Even justice is not enough without a sand. And that is why our goal as community should be to aspire for a sand.
سمع الله حميدا الله أكبر الله الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله 